what a glorious day it is to be in God's house together on this Lord's Day, the day that we have commemorated and set aside for the resurrection. In fact, every Sunday you meet at a church is a memorial to the Lord who rose from the dead. Every Sunday that we meet is a memorial to remember the resurrection. You know, there was no council that sat down and changed the day of worship. There isn't some conspiracy theory that sat down and said, let's change the day of worship. Jesus rose from the third, on the third day, and because of that, it changed the whole landscape of the world as we know it. It even changed the day when the early, uh, the early Jewish uh, folks would, would worship. And so we meet today, and we commemorate the resurrection. On this day, we recognize the day that the Lord Jesus walked out of the grave. You know, we find ourselves today thinking about the sovereignty of God. We think, we're thinking about the sovereignty and how our Lord is in control of all of our lives. And so we often find ourselves in any particular worship service giving a welcome to the crowd. And so we welcome you today in God's house. Welcome you, those who might be visitors among us. And we might even say, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for worshiping with us, worshiping with your family. But in reality, God has brought you to this place. In reality, God has put you here today. We, we are, we're thankful that you are worshiping with us today, but, but we are not here ultimately for our own satisfaction or to make us feel as if we're holy somehow. We don't come today on this day just, just to make us feel as if we're a little closer to God. We're not here today just so we can feel a little bit more super spiritual because we, we come on an on a Easter service. We are here because of the resurrection. We are here because he is, he is alive and alive for, forevermore. That is something to, to celebrate. Now, if you don't mind today, and I hope you don't, and even if you do, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you anyways. We come today to glorify God. We don't come because we want to feel somehow that our attendance on an Easter Sunday service, particularly Easter, is going to make us feel super special and spiritual. And so I ask you on this note, what are your motives for being here today? What are your motives for being here today? Is it to turn your attention to the risen Lord and to set for 20 some minutes from this point on to a, to a sermon that will press you on your motives? To, to ask yourself, are my motives pure? Are they meaningful? Have I been forced to come to the house of the Lord today? Or maybe your mind is elsewhere this morning. So I would ask you in just a few moments, just a few minutes, let's... Let's get our mind off that Easter Sunday ham that might be, that might be cooking right now or, or that hamburgers that we might serve later on. Let's, for just a few moments, let's get, our mind, let's get our mind on the things that God wants to say to his church. When you really think about it, we live in a very self-centered world, don't we? We live in a very selfish world, a, a self-centered world that I'm afraid that every single one of us fall into. Some maybe more than others, but in this self-centered world that we live in, we essentially, in the Americas, we do what we want when we want to do it, don't we? We do what we want, and sometimes discipline is a lost cause amongst the Christ follower. We don't have that discipline anymore. We talk about ministries that sustain and have longevity. It is because there is discipline and discipleship behind it. In this self-centered world, discipleship is, is a term that we don't hear very, very often. 
So we find ourselves doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, and if we want to lay on our backs on a Sunday morning, instead of enforcing the discipline of worship, then quite frankly, some people do that. If the resurrection is the most important event in history, in the world, if the, if the event of the resurrection changed, changed the landscape of the world, if it change the spiritual dynamic of the world that we live in. If Jesus walking out of the grave was the greatest event in world history, then it should give us enough drive and desire that we should want to serve Jesus with every breath that we have and not just one day committed on the calendar. That doesn't have to be on Easter Sunday. That doesn't have to be on any other Sunday during the week. But all week, every day, 24-7, Jesus should be on the breath that we speak. But let me assure you, we're no different than anyone else in the world that struggles with the flesh. Because we all do. We all struggle with the flesh. This tension between spirit and the flesh is something that will not go away until our resurrected Lord comes and takes us to be with him. So we'll always have this struggle between flesh and spirit. I mean, Jesus even addressed his disciples in the garden as they couldn't even stay awake during the time of prayer. He highlighted this point. He said in Matthew 26 and verse 41, Jesus said, Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is what? It's weak. It's weak. So I want to be the Christ follower that is committed to the work of the Lord with every breath that I have. And I need not only help from the Holy Spirit of God, but I also need help from my Christian brothers and sisters. I need help from, from those who claim the name of Jesus. I need help from my Christian brothers and sisters to help me in this walk. I cannot do it alone. You might say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be super spiritual. Well, who says? Who said that? Who said pastors don't have, have flaws and struggles? Who said pastors don't need people that they can talk to and confide in? I need my Christian brothers and sisters to help me in this walk just like you do. But I, I mean, I am inspired and I gather strength from many, in, even in this congregation. Many in this congregation that inspire and help me to press on whether they know it or not. Whether they know it or not, there's many men and women in this congregation that give me strength and give me inspiration. Now you might know it, but there are some people sitting here today in this congregation that I could say, I wish that I could do more of that. I wish I could be more like them in my walk. I wish I can have that type of, of wisdom in my walk with the Lord, that, that type of insight where I don't need a lot of prompting. I just do it. But we're no different than people all over the world that find themselves in a battle between flesh and spirit. We're no different than the church at Corinth. We're going to read about it in just a few moments. We're no different than the people at, at Corinth with her many, many problems. So let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's just survey just for a moment. Here's a local church that has many problems, as does many local bodies in the world today. Now, we might not have everything in common with them, but the one thing we do have in common with, with any other local bodies are imperfect people serving there. And so we're going to have problems, we're going to have, we're going to have issues. I, I think of American churches in terms of, of struggles and American churches don't so much struggle with the materialistic things. Their struggle with materialism is how, to, is how to not make them an idol. Okay, so think of the churches in, in America and their issues become more of, of, of spiritual in nature. Think about it in terms of the world. Think of it in terms of the world, our third country 
brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in the remote places of the earth who know about Jesus. We can learn loads of truth from our, from our brothers and sisters across the world. But the question must remain, in churches in America, we sit comfortably. I can go in there right now if we're a little warm and I can bump the air on, can I? So, our third world brothers and sisters can teach us something about worshiping the risen Lord. Well, they're not so concerned about the color of the carpet we have or the pews or what kind of wood grain we have or whether or not we should have gold or silver communion trays. They don't have to worry about these things. And so, so they can teach us some things about spiritual matters and, resur- and, and worshiping the resurrection, resurrected Lord. But what can, we, what can they learn from us what can they learn from us what can we teach them in regards to worshiping the risen the risen Lord what what can we teach them about worshiping the resurrected Christ we learn from one of the early churches in the word of God the church at Corinth becomes a mirror of, sor- of sorts, as is God's word throughout, a mirror of sorts to the life of the local body of believers, even within the modern world. With our Bibles in hand, let's turn to the book of, of 1 Corinthians. Here's a church that had many problems and many issues. There was uh, in, embedded in the church at Corinth an incestuous affair. There was a lack of church, lack of church discipline. Hear me, lack of church discipline. There were those that were abusing the Lord's Supper, not reflecting rightly on the elements of the Lord's Supper. There were those that were highlighting certain spiritual gifts over others as to say, if you don't have these gifts, then you're not super spiritual there was power plays within the church who's going to have more power is it this one or is it that one now at this point you should say that sounds very familiar to American churches doesn't it now there were those that were having a difficult time reconciling the resurrection with their strong Greek influence that sees this body that you carry around as a bad or an or an evil thing and to really truly be free is to be free of this body in their Greek way of thinking you shed the body you're truly free and so the resurrection for many in the church at Corinth has become a stumbling block or a new or unfamiliar truth Paul writes to the church and he offers an explanation and offers them a a gift of confidence don't you like it when brothers and sisters when you're down, sometimes they'll come along and they might not even know that they have done anything for you and they offer you a word and it gives you confidence and it lifts your spirit, it lifts you up. Aren't you, aren't you glad for those brothers and sisters? We talk about needing them. Those are the times that we really truly need them. But Paul, he writes to this church, he offers them this gift of confidence that only comes through Jesus resurrected. So, I want to highlight a few things surveying 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because he lives, our faith is not dead. Because he lives, our faith is not dead, nor is it in vain. We have heard already Mr. Randy Reed in the morning selection of scripture of these verses before us. He, he read the first four verses of Corinthians and what we would call a historical discourse from the hand of the Apostle Paul saying in verse 1, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered it to you as a first importance. And listen, he says, What I also received. Paul was given the gospel by some faithful disciples. The gospel was passed to Paul and so Paul passed the gospel on and so forth and so on. He said that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Jesus said that he would die and rise again, didn't he? For that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Is the resurrection real? Does the resurrection have power? The question on the table 
to answer the veracity of the resurrection is yes, emphatically, it is real. There is power. Nothing else matters in our life if Jesus is not risen from the dead. The dead are raised, but only because of the resurrection. Without Christ walking out of the grave, we are lost and we are still in our sins. We might as well close our Bibles, put our hymn books back where they belong, close the doors, go home and never come back and just live some type of hedonistic life if Christ not be alive. A dead Savior is not a Savior at all. A dead Savior is not a Savior. He's just like Muhammad in the grave. He's just like Confucius or any other world cult that has come onto the scene and has led people astray. He would be just like any other dead religious figure today that is rotting in the grave. But he's not there. He's alive, alive forevermore. Without the bodily historical resurrection, we're all still lost. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul says, then not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain as well. So let's go home. If he's not real, our faith becomes futile if Jesus is not risen. Paul spends a lot of time highlighting the, the risen Lord and dispelling any myths that might be circulating. Paul is defending historical bodily resurrection and he says this, that the last enemy to be destroyed is, is death. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Ultimately, sin has been wrapped up in victory. Jesus has defeated. Jesus has defeated sin. And the last enemy, it says, is, is death. And so because Jesus lives, we live. And our faith is not in vain. Because Jesus lives, we might live, and we might reign with him forever. Have you ever thought about what is coming because of the resurrection? Have you ever thought about what the future might hold because he's alive? I think of the future and our future resurrection and the truth that we get to spend eternity with Christ and we get to worship him forever. You try to think about what that might be like. Have you ever thought about what that might look like as we are face to face with Jesus? One of the issues at the church at Corinth and also what you'll find in the church of Thessalonica, you'll find that there was misconceptions over what happened to those who we love who have gone on to be with the Lord. And so Paul would say, would not have you ignorant brethren. And then he explains what happens at the moment of death when the body that is raised in corruption is planted and then risen in, in, in incorruptible status through Christ so there was this misconception. What happens to our loved ones who died and go on before us? For those Christ followers, they've been planted in the earth like a mighty, like an acorn and be risen in this powerful, incorruptible thing. For those Christ followers will one day be resurrected. But without the resurrection, there would be no, as the song says, graves bursting forth in glorious day. There would be none of that. But I often hear people say, and you might be one of them, and I often find myself saying this too. I cannot wait till I get to see my daddy in heaven. I cannot wait to see my loved ones in heaven. I'm with you. I mean, I can't wait to be able to see my, my dad. Look, my brother's here. <laughs> I can't wait to be able to see my dad. My mother's here. I can't wait to see my grandfather and my grandmother who've gone on to be with the Lord. I can't wait for that day. I can't wait to see people who I've grown to love in, the, in, my, in my church, my first church I ever pastored, a man by the name of Willie Frank. I cannot wait to, to see Willie Frank. And I've just compiled a list right here of people that I cannot wait to see when I get to heaven. Mr. Wilfred, Miss Mildred, Miss Cairo, NR, Mr. Joe, Laura Lilly, HM, Bruce Sr., Mr. Tupper, Frankie, Ben and Hannah, Tucker, uh, Betty Winslow, Vera Harrington, uh, Kay and Pat, uh, Patricia Pittman, Miss Ruby Revels. Man, I can't, I can't wait to see those people. And there's probably many more that I missed. Many more that I want to see when I get to, 
to heaven. People that have impacted my life. Mr. Lomax McLean. I can't forget Mr. Lomax McLean. People that are worshiping Jesus right now on this list. People worshiping Jesus. But if seeing Jesus isn't the first thing on our list, then maybe heaven isn't for me. If seeing Jesus first, if Jesus doesn't supersede that list, then maybe my priorities are out of whack. Theologically thinking, the way that we're supposed to think doesn't always line up. Because theologically thinking, we, we sympathize waiting to see our loved ones. But realistically, realistically, according to God's word, at the moment of death, seeing Jesus will be all that matters. Now don't get me wrong, my finite mind right now wants to see my dad, wants to see my grandparents, wants to see those folks on that list who've gone on before me, who are worshiping and are pursuing Jesus forevermore. But Christ is all that matters at the moment of death. Nothing will matter except for seeing our Lord. But you also must know that you have to know him to be able to pursue and to worship him. You have to know him. You have to know him. You have to know the resurrected Lord. He has to have taken his, your sin upon him himself or you'll never pursue him forever. You'll never worship him forever. So the question is, is Christ yours? It, here's the question. You often hear it. Doesn't make it, any, doesn't, doesn't make it not true. So here's the question. If, if you died right now, would, would you see a resurrected and glorified Jesus if you died right now, you know, how, you know how it's framed. If you died tonight, would you, would you be in heaven or hell? Now listen, to, to frame this correctly, I would, I would say if you died right now, would you see a resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ or would you be separated from him forever? Now you've probably heard that question. It doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that, that, that statement is not true. Jesus didn't die on the cross a horrible death. And rise again simply for a heavenly family reunion. He died so we might have union with him first and foremost. Now will I get to see my loved ones? I hope so. I'm sure we will. But will I get to worship Jesus with him? Yeah, sure. I know we will. But see a Jesus Christ resurrected is first. And our faith is not dead because he is alive. Because he lives we are also changed forever. Because he lives, we are changed forevermore. Paul spends a lot of time in chapter 15 highlighting the importance of Christ alive. And so now he applies this to the believers saying, if Christ is not alive, then we are all perishing forever. We are all dead in our sins. Because he is, because he is risen, we will also have a resurrection body. He says in verse 35, but some will say, well, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they, do, do they come? You foolish person, Paul says you what you sow does not come to life unless it dies first and what you sow is not the body that is to be but a bare kernel a seed perhaps of wheat or some other grain but God gives it a body as he has chosen to each kind of its seed is it is its body so Paul is speaking of course to people who are very keen on what it what it means to plant a seed and see it grow Maybe he was talking to people who, who know what it meant uh, to be in farming or agriculture and, and saying what you plant in the ground will not come forth the same way. So what is buried in this corruptible, weak, frail body will be raised in a glorified body, seed and fit by God to refashion. Paul likens the body to a seed planted into the ground. The, the seed is planted into the ground and it sprouts, sprouts forth out of that ground in due time, in perfect time. So the corruptible body, as Paul says, is planted in the ground and is risen as incorruptible. You must understand that as Paul is addressing his Corinthian audience, I mean, these people were embedded with a Greek philosophy. And as I already mentioned, this was a foreign concept to them. See, the body that you carried around, according to Greek philosophers, was a, was a, was a, was a shell. This is evil because it is a materialistic thing. And to, and to be free from the trappings of this flesh is to truly to be free because we, we drop, if you will, at a moment of death, this thing that's supposed to be evil and corrupt. 
But according to God's word, what does it say about human beings? What does it say in Genesis 1 and 26? It says that we were created in the image of God. We were created in his image and in his likeness. And better yet, to survey the Old Testament into the New Testament at the moment that Jesus rose again from the dead and sent his blessed Holy Spirit, we have become new creatures in Christ who are formed in the likeness of Jesus because of a rebirth. So what God started in the image of likeness in the garden has ultimately found its place in the resurrection of Christ. When you plant a seed in the ground, it doesn't come back looking exactly the same, does it? It comes back changed forever. The crop or the yield can be a thing of beauty when it springs forth. What is buried in this weak and frail and corruptible body will be risen in strength. When you go out to the graveyard, as we've done so early this morning... You remember a loved one that is in that grave. You read the headstone and, man, you remember a lot of things in their life. You remember, you know, having dinner at their house or spending time together in the summer or the spring. The thing I remember about my father the most is the time that we would go fishing. A whole lot. I mean, a whole lot. But please know that that body is awaiting a grand resurrection when at once the bodies, those bodies who are in Christ, will receive what Paul says, an incorruptible body, built by God himself. If in the beginning God created, in the beginning God said, if God creates at the very beginning humankind, then who's to say that God can't create and speak those bodies out of the grave and give them a glorified body simply by his word, he will give us an incorruptible body fit to be in the presence and the glory of God forever. This frail and corruptible thing that we're carrying around right now, unless it is refashioned by God, will never be able to stand in the presence of our Creator without being consumed and utterly destroyed. Go back to the Exodus, Mount Sinai. Why did God hide Moses in the cleft of the rock while he passed by? Because if Moses was to see the glory of God, poof! He would be destroyed. So God gives us an incorruptible body to be able to worship in the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Without the resurrection, without the res resurrection of Jesus, this is not a reality. Paul reminds us about this body. He says... It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. In the latter section of Corinthians, Paul writes of this great mystery of the body that will be changed in a moment of a twinkling of an eye. Now, you know that there have been some scientists from GE who have tried to calculate what a moment of a twinkling of an eye is. Now I can't tell you exactly their exact measurements, but I mean, is that what Paul's trying to do? Is, is Paul trying to say, you know, somewhere down in the year 2000 something, there's going to be some scientists who are going to try to figure this thing out. Do you think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote that? Or do you think that something of this was being said? And I know something of this was being said. Before you can bat an eye, before you can get your eyelid down or either up, whatever direction, that the Lord will change this, in, this corruptible body into something incorruptible, before you can look twice, God would have done that good thing. It is when we have been supplied with this glorified body, fit for eternity, fit to be in the glory of God, worshiping forever, when we can truly say, death where is your sting? For this perishable body must put on imperishable. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall it come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
to ask the rhetorical question, Oh, death, where is your victory? It is not here. Oh, death, where is your sting? You've lost your sting of death when Jesus trapes out of the grave alive and forevermore. Death has no bearing on the child of God. Amen? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law and without the resurrection, without the risen Lord, we are still in sin. Paul spends many words to stress this importance of the bodily and yes, historical, grounded in history. Just look at the lives of the apostles. Look at the lives of the disciples, how they turn upside down. He, he spends time defending this historical resurrection of, of our Lord and, and we believe in the resurrection. But let me ask you this today. Do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe that Christ rose again? How about you today who've never confessed Christ risen? Now you might ask, well, so what? Jesus rose from the dead. What does that mean for me? You know, there's not a theologian alive, liberal or otherwise, that would ever deny the existence of Jesus. And if Jesus existed and we followed this train of thought, then he must have risen from the dead. So you might say, so what? So what if it's true? We would say that Christ is real. We've, we've affirmed that this morning by, by being here and worshiping him. Yes, Christ is real. No theologian who ever walked the face of the earth would be so naive and dumb as to say that Jesus did not exist. We would say that his resurrection is real. His words were real. The judgment that he passed is real. His wrath is real. And he also loves you so much that he sent his son to die. The only begotten. The word can be his only unique son. He came to die so that you might avoid a real hell. Yes, hell exists. Yes, hell exists. But salvation is from God's wrath and his separation. It is at the door, as A.J. Welp said in, in uh, a little excerpt called Resurrection, Fact or Fiction. He says, as he starts where we all should start, Romans 10, verse 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I challenge you to disprove the resurrection as so many have tried to do in the past and have failed. Not just a cursory search as those who are looking for a, a recipe for cookies, but a true and diligent study of the known information that we have. Take a few weeks to know for certain that you are correct. What else are you doing, he says. If it is false, then nothing matters. If it is true, then everything has meaning and purpose and value. And I say because of the resurrection, everything has meaning and purpose and value. Many have set out to disprove the resurrection of Christ and had the intellectual integrity to admit their mistake. But many, many more have not. We're here today about to take communion because he is alive. If Christ is not riven, risen, let's just go ahead and put the communion trays. In fact, just leave them back there. Don't even empty them. If Christ is not alive, let's just, let's leave. Lock the doors. And let the cobwebs and the dust and the spiders take over. If Christ is not alive, let's just go home and do essentially what this flesh wants to do. If we're honest with ourselves. So the question is, have you believed in Christ, the risen Lord? Maybe you needed that reinforcement this morning that just assures you that your faith is real because he is alive. That reassurance because of the resurrection. You have been changed and are being changed. You're being conformed perpetually until Christ returns into the image of our Lord Jesus. What a wonderful truth that is. But it only happens if Christ is alive. So as we affirm that today, I'll ask you, is the resurrection true? Is the resurrection true? In this moment of contemplation on the elements of the Lord's Supper, I'm going to call the deacons forward to administer the elements 
of the Lord's table. If you guys would come forward and prepare to distribute the elements. I'm going to ask you, is the resurrection real? Is Christ alive? You know,